treatment effect, it's an inference. For the ATT, the inference is on um, like T1 and T2, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so uh, like you need like T1 to be large enough, number of pre-treatment time years, you need T2 to be large enough. Uh, and, and the ATT is average. It's not, not kind of like what you usually think of. It's, it's actually because we're only looking at one treatment unit, um, the right. average is over the number of post-treatment time periods. So presumably you could like use different values of T2 and get the ATT. It's not like exactly you know, per period, but that's kind of like the see. closest. Um, so you, you, get you to. sort of chop the T2 and see what happens. Potentially, yeah, that's kind T2. of the best you can yeah. do. Okay. Yeah. In, fact, in fact, if you remember the simulation, Kathy had a slide where she showed different T2s, uh, maybe 50, 100, and so on. And, and, and you could see that regardless of the, at least in the simulation, that's for the uh, inference theory, uh, we could be confident that regardless of the time period, so you, you know, back to your point about whether we are measuring it immediately after or day by day, we should have that because the inference theory is robust to that. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, you also made a point, uh, which is, you know, you, you want, you, you would suggested that we justify the nonlinearity a little bit better. But if you look at the pre-treatment data, we had uh, much fewer because the COVID-19 cases started, um, you know, in March or uh, end of February, and we had the lifting happen on the 1st of May. Uh, even there, you could see a nonlinearity, although you could say it could be piecewise linear. Uh, which is what you're referring to. I guess you see the kind of S shape go on. But this is granularity is at a um, daily level. But if you can, uh, if you, assuming that COVID-19 plays out over several years, you could see that there's a, I mean, if you see the pattern even now, you go to Google Trends data, you would see um, a lot of nonlinearity already there. So maybe in this data that we have, uh, we had limited T1, but in general, these kind of data in public health and marketing show a lot of nonlinearity, non-stationarity. And, you know, the, the the unknown structure is very clear. You know, it could be due to random uh, walk. It could be due to trending. Uh, it could be due to cycles. It could be due to so many things and a combination of that. And that's where I think uh, this uh, inference theory is very, very helpful because it 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 makes sure regardless of what are these different types of unknown structures, we still have an inference theory and we could still use this method and we could have a more reliable estimate. And that could yeah. guide policy decisions better. I just want to yeah, mention, I think this 2017 paper, if I remember correctly, is this the generalized synthetic control paper? They don't actually have inference theory. So they, right. their main contribution <laughs> is they propose a method and then they propose using bootstrapping, but there's actually no uh, inference theory that's derived in that right. paper. So, yeah, and they do, they actually define the ATT similarly to us. Um, yeah, over yeah. The, yeah. But if you, if you use the package, um, it provides um, the inference for every time period. So that's one. Right. I but there's no theory, yeah. right? Like you can yeah, do it. it um, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think the 2020 paper used uh, Wabi Parker um, uh, application. And I think that application seems to be more non-stationary and non-linear compared to um, this application. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. what I what I thought uh, when yeah. I first read the, the paper. Yeah. yeah. But thank um, you so much. This is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers. This is very thoughtful. Very, very thoughtful. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nanda, and uh, thanks everybody who's staying so late. <clears throat> and I had a comment, but thank you before you. <laughs> so yeah. I want to follow up on the discussions. So I think this time trend matters, especially for COVID-19, is that you get a sense of, say, um, capacity is very important, for example, ICU. So you get a sense of when you need to prepare for that. So how much time you have and things like that. And then I think earlier you guys mentioned about test. Um, I was wondering whether like when, when, when the state has more cases and the people are, more and more people are closer to who they are, so they're more likely to go ahead and test themselves. 
So in that case, mm -hmm. the the case would be uh, overestimated because more people are testing proportionally. So if we, I think one thing can be done, I don't know how it's possible with the data support, is, is to get a sense of the case and the test, some kind of relationship. So all you need to do is just adjust by this kind of parameter. Maybe this parameter is one, so you don't need to do any adjusting, but maybe it's above one, below one. So what you know, changing the number qualitative a little bit. And some people from the field of public policy, public health may have some ideas. Thank you. Good suggestion. Uh, is Nanda is the wrap up in this uh, room or? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's closing this, remarks in this room. Okay. Yeah, just stay. Don't don't leave yet. I think uh, they are wrapping up now. Okay. So while we're waiting, uh, Venki, do you have other events that you could model the same way in relation to COVID? Like other things that happen, let's say at the local level or national level or other interventions or announcements or policies or anything else? Or is this just a one time thing, one event? Uh, we looked at the COVID-19 as the main focus for our circle, but we were open to any suggestions on other applications because we also had to get data. This was the uh, this was possible to get the data for all the states at the right time. Um, Having said that, there are other states we, are, we can also look at. They also had lifting, uh, like again, California imposed uh, the shelter in place in January of this uh, year. But, um, you know, we also need some decent amount of T1 and T2 observations. So this is almost like a uh, running data, right? So even as we speak, we're getting some data and so on. So but it, methodologically, it, it, though, just to, to interrupt for a second, methodologically, is it possible to extend the methodology to account for multiple events in the same way so that you have multiple, um, you know, vertical lines uh, that are, you know, mm -hmm. are happening? Yeah, so basically what when you run it, you're essentially running it like one treatment unit at a time. So if you had like other states that lifted, you could just run the ATT for that and then you could decide how you wanted to like aggregate the ATTs across different states. Um, if you're looking at a completely different intervention, I would probably not aggregate those. Like if you're looking at, uh, you know, because then it would be hard to summarize, like what is that aggregation of those two different types of interventions? And in the data set, there actually is pretty detailed information about uh, what type of interventions are happening. Some of them are just like, you know, the, the state like had some announcement or some warning, you know, and these are not very strong interventions. So I think the challenge is like finding a strong enough intervention where you think there would be an effect. Um, and also, as Enki said, you know, enough pre and post treatment time periods, enough control units to be able to use. If it's a national level intervention, you're not really going to be able to use this method unless you're comparing across countries, because then you essentially don't have any control units or control states to use. Yeah. But, but Arnan, uh, is your question more of can we develop an inference theory when there are multiple events or is your question yeah. one of applications? Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in the methodology. I'm, I'm also interested in the application, mm -hmm. both of these. The data yeah. is interesting, <laughs> but the methodology is really interesting. And the question is, can you extend that methodology? Of, uh, forget about the data for a second, mm -hmm. just the methodology itself to have a sequence yeah. of events and do, you know, use the same methodology for a sequence. It's, it just complicates things, but I can I can think of a lot more applications in that sort of methodology. Yeah, yeah, so we can, but we're kind of doing it in a very simple way, which is you kind of just look at the window pre post that particular intervention, you do a bit again, and then you can decide, you know, I want to average over these 10 interventions or something. But I think this idea of staggered staggered adoption, I think is what it's kind of called, referred to in the yes. literature, is pretty interesting, and there's definitely a lot of people working on it <laughs> right now, too. By the way, uh, our theory will still apply, but uh, the question is, uh, you know, if you want to, the ATT, estimate uh, is what you may be thinking about. Uh, inference theory may be still be applicable, but you know the accurate estimation of ATT uh, when there are staggered events, um, we still have to think about it. It's, it's not trivial. Okay, some discussion can go offline, I guess. So. Thank you. All right. 
So uh, first, I want to actually begin by thanking all of the participants and uh, you know folks that actually submitted the, their their work uh, for this conference. I think uh, we were not sure whether we we're going to able be able to pull off the conference, but uh, we we're fortunate to do that, especially after what what happened last week. Um, so um, you know, interestingly, I was just looking at the registrations. We had 125 faculty register, and we had close to 70 PhD students register for this conference. So I think this has been, I think, the largest conference uh, that we've actually hosted. Um, so I want to thank all, all, uh, all the uh, folks that submitted. Um, we had close to 80 submissions, so I wish we could have accepted all 80 papers, but unfortunately we had a constraint. So um, and and you know many of the really good papers we simply could not accept, and I'm going to blame. Uh, our program committee, which comprised of Jun Hong, uh, who is probably fast asleep in Singapore. Paul, I don't know if he's here, Paul Alexson, um, Oded uh, at LBS, and uh, Dina and Amin Saidi, uh, Dina Maislin and Amin Saidi. So these are the people that actually helped me select the papers. Um, and I also want to uh, thank all the discussants for the hard work that they put in. And, uh, I enjoyed many of the discussions. Um, most of the discussions. Um, um, and with that, I will uh, turn it over to Ying. Oh, before I want to say a very important thing. This conference could not have been pulled off without the help of Melissa and Kelly. So really, I want to thank both of them. Uh, and uh, Kelly has really been, uh, you know, the real sort of uh, force behind the conference. So she's the one who's kind of uh, made my job uh, really, really easy. So thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Melissa, uh, for um, supporting uh, the conference the way you've always uh, done. So thank you. So uh, thank you, everybody. Ying, are you there? Yes, I'm here. OK, over to you. OK, so uh, I guess I will just take this opportunity to um, you know, um, say thank you to Nanda. I mean, I know this conference uh, and to Kelly and Melissa for really, you know, make sure that the, the conference, you know, we are able to offer this conference this year, you know, in these very special circumstances. And uh, I, I know there's like small hiccup here and there, but I think overall, like we have really good presentations, very high quality discussion. And I, I don't know whether this is kind of the advantage of a virtual conference. We are able to include like 32 papers, which is like 33% increase over the, you know, the usual conference. So I think we have a very wide, you know, range of topics and very interesting papers. So, I mean, without Nanda, you know, um, Kelly, and uh, help from Melissa, this probably would not happen. So really, thank you so much um, for making this conference, uh, you know, a possibility. Um, I don't know whether we will be able to, you know, have our life return to normal in fall 2021. That's my hope, and that's uh, the university's plan. So if that's the case, I think I hope that the next year. So Kelly said that she's going to run the conference again next year together with Nanda. So I'm sure that, uh, you know, it will be, uh, I don't know, I, I can't promise, but I hope next year we will all, you know, come back. I mean, virtual conference is great, but I, I still really enjoy all this fun time, you know, kind of outside just presentation and discussion. So hope our life will kind of return to the pre, you know, COVID time again next year. So, um, Ram, you want to say something? No, no, I'm fine. I I just had a fun time. So, <laughs> so. okay. I, I do want to add one thing. I mean, I think. Uh, 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 you know, we had participants across the world. I mean, we had folks from mm -hmm. Australia. We had folks from so basically we uh, went from so the Eastern Hemisphere to all the way to the Western Hemisphere, the complete globe covered all time zones. You know, Sungjin was in Hawaii. So all time zones in the United States have been covered. So it was a fascinating uh, level of participation that we got from across the globe. So so that that's something that uh, uh, we were able to wing, I think, because of the virtual conference. Yeah. Anyway, thanks again, Melissa. Thanks again, Kelly. Okay. I'm leaving. Bye, guys. Bye.
Bye bye. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you for high quality bye. content. Bye. Bye. Thank you.